Mike Sneed, George Schwartz, as well as the rest of the Washington and Lee team for having me here today. I'm excited to be here talking to you about this customized benefit that can be used for both you and any family members or loved ones. Care.com is a national benefit, so whether you're calling about a mom who lives in Virginia or your dad who may live in California, we can still help you. So how many of you are familiar with Care.com? Currently, there are 65.7 million 
which means that they're caring for a parent and for a child. And the average caregiver spends about 20 hours a week providing care for a loved one. While 13% of all caregivers spend 40 hours a week providing care for a family member. This is like a full-time job. And on top of that, 6 out of 10 caregivers are balancing the responsibilities of a job as well. Now, you do have the option of hiring a caregiver, but currently 80% of the care that's being provided is being provided by unpaid friend and family caregivers. And it was estimated in 2009 that the cost of the unpaid family caregiver was $450 billion. This is more than the total Medicaid spending for that year. So as you can see, there's a lot of care that is being provided. <coughs> and it's only going to increase as the population increases. <coughs> so, as we continue to talk about these caregivers, what do these caregivers do? Well, they can help with a, a multiple assortment of things, such as hands-on assistance with bathing or dressing, meal preparation. <coughs> they can help manage finances for an individual or help run errands, and they provide emotional support. Although all of this can seem very taxing, and for those of you who may be in a caregiving role know how challenging it is, caregiving can be a positive thing too. Caregivers often can increase relationships and strengthen relationships with their siblings as they work through different challenges trying to figure out the best plan of care for their parents. You may also redefine your relationship with your parent if you're caring for them. As you take the time to simply sit and spend time with them, maybe doing an activity that they enjoy. This is often hard in our hectic schedules to do. Even if you have a parent that has Alzheimer's or dementia, you can still develop a new relationship with them as you learn to slow down in life and be present in the moment. As this is often how people with dementia function in the here and the now. Some care caregivers have also even developed a new sense of humor as they learn to deal with different, with different challenges and different tasks with caregiving and learning how to go about that and how to solve those new issues. So although caregiving is a very challenging and tasking behavior, there are positives and rewards to caregiving too. And it can be a life-changing experience. Now, when we refer to caregivers, we don't just mean people who may have their parents living in the house with them. Caregivers can also be long distance. And by long distance, we mean anyone who is living an hour or more away from the person they're caring for. In fact, 15% of all caregivers are long distance caregivers. And this can be challenging because you're trying to manage and coordinate care from a distance when you don't have the eyes on every day that you may want for your parent. However, there are supports for these caregivers and supports for your loved one who may want to stay in the home and age in place. And you can still do that even if you're not physically there caring for them. A geriatric care manager is a great resource that you can use to support your loved ones. Geriatric care managers are social workers or nurses who can actually be in the home and have eyes on your loved one. They can serve as an advocate and a guide identifying problems, and offering solutions. It can be a liaison between your loved one and you, or coordinate, res coordinate resources, or communicate between all parties involved. They can go to doctor's appointments. They can do all of these things for you so that you have someone there when maybe you can't be there as often as you need like. GRT care managers typically run about $100 to $150 an hour, but many families find this as a great benefit, especially if they want somebody's eyes on their loved one and being able to communicate to the whole family about what's going on. I'll give you an example. So we've worked with a family, we'll call this woman Jane. Jane lived in Florida and she lived about an hour and a half away from her two parents who lived in an assisted living community. Jane's father had fallen and was hospitalized. He was then moved to a rehab center so he could get the rehab that he needed before returning home. Jane had gone one day to the rehab to visit her father and was concerned because she didn't feel that he was receiving the appropriate care at this rehab. 
Jane then found out that the x-rays from the hospital didn't even make it over to the rehab, and they didn't know about some of the fractures that he had. She didn't know who to turn to in the rehab and didn't know what questions to ask, felt that nobody was listening and felt that her father wasn't receiving the right care. So Jane called us, and we were able to connect her with the geriatric care manager. That person could go into the rehab and make sure that her father was receiving the appropriate care. They could communicate between the hospital and the rehab, making sure that those x-rays did get over, and that her father was being treated for the right things. They could also evaluate, making sure that when the rehab was ready to discharge their father, that he was in fact ready to go home. And the geriatric care manager could make sure that the home was a safe place for him to go back to. If any modifications needed to be put in place, they could help with that. And finally, the geriatric care manager could communicate all of this to all three siblings who lived in different states. So in this example, the geriatric care manager turned out to be a great resource for the family. Home modifications can also be put in place to help a loved one. Things such as grab bars, handrails, or wheelchair ramps can be installed in your house. You can also increase lighting, get rid of throw rugs, or widen doorways as other measures to keep the house safe for a loved one. Be sure that if you're going to use any home modification companies, that these people have experience working in senior care. So they really will know everything to look for when they're in the house to make it as safe as possible. Emergency response systems are another means that can keep your loved one safe. These are devices that the person can wear that will alert emergency services if they fall and need assistance. Some even have automatic alert systems that if the person can't push the button when they fall, emergency services can still be alerted. Home monitoring systems, things such as webcams or alarms, can also be installed to help make sure that your loved one is safe if you're caregiving from a distance. Or medication reminders can be installed on, a, say, a pill box. These can sound an alarm and shine a light so that when it's time to take the medication, your loved one will know. They can also dispense the medication for your loved one if you're not sure if your loved one can take the right dosage of medication. And they can send automatic reminders when it's time to refill the medication. And your senior care advisor can actually connect you with all of these different services in your area if you feel like any of these would be appropriate for somebody in your family. So in addition to challenges of caregiving from a distance, 60% of caregivers are also working. And working doesn't, caregiving doesn't stop when you get to work. Now this can be challenging for you and the employer, as it's estimated that employers lose between 17 and 34 billion dollars in productivity costs from caregivers. But it's hard. Your mom's caregiver called in sick today, and you're having a hard time finding a backup. But mom can't be left home alone. Or you just found out that dad is being discharged from rehab tomorrow, and the home isn't safe yet for him to go home to. There needs to be some modifications put in place. So what do you do? Where do you find the time to do all of this? Employers are becoming more aware of the demand that caregiving takes, and are therefore putting supports in place to help individuals with their caregiving needs. Talk to HR to find out what supports you do have in place through your employer. You can attend seminars, educational webinars, benefit fairs, to find out more about those benefits. Also, talk to your supervisor if you have caregiving responsibilities, especially if this is going to impact your work. Often, caregiving requires individuals to take time off from work. So find out what policies are in place to support you in this. The Family Medical Leave Act is one example that can support caregivers in time off as it allows caregivers to take 12 weeks off in a 12-month period of unpaid time, but still maintaining job security. So find out what other supports that you have in place through your employer. Care.com is one of those for you. So now as we move on to talk about the different options of care, I have a brief quiz for you, which I felt like was only appropriate since we're at a university. <laughs> Caregiving and senior care can be so overwhelming and challenging and foreign to people. Senior care is complex. We 
because you're dealing with multiple decision makers, various family dynamics, different options for care, different ways to pay for care, illness, disability, the list goes on and on. And many people don't know what questions to ask or where to even start. So planning ahead is so important so that you can be prepared for some of the challenges associated with aging. So this quiz can give you an idea of maybe some, some areas you may already know about senior care and maybe some areas going forward to look into. This is interactive. Please shout out the answers. It's okay if you get it wrong. So the first question, what is the average cost of a nursing home per year in the United States? Any guesses? $35,000. Higher. Not manage 
manage all of these responsibilities anymore. But her siblings felt that since she wasn't working due to her health, that she was home during the day, and it was her responsibility to care for their mom. We were able to have a telephonic consultation with all of the siblings and talk about where their mom was at in her care needs, and talk, give them options of what they could do to support their mom and support their sister as she was dealing with all of these challenges of her own health and her caregiving responsibilities. In the end, we were able to connect the family with supports to help their mom and help their sister. So be sure that through all of this, as hard as it is to take the time to care for yourself, that this is a priority. So now we're going to talk about how to pay for care. We're just going to run through this kind of quickly because this could be an hour-long presentation in itself. Um, so if you have questions, definitely feel free to ask or I can even talk to you more about it at the end of the presentation. The first is Medicare. And you can think of this as an insurance for individuals who are 65 and older. Medicare pays for things such as hospital stays up to 100 days, physician's visits, hospice, and some prescription drugs depending on the type of plan that you have. Again, Medicare does not pay for long-term care. Medicaid is next. And Medicaid covers similar to what Medicare does, as it does cover hospital visits, physician visits, and prescription drug coverage. But it's for individuals who are of low income. And every state has different eligibility criteria. Medicaid, however, does pay for long-term care. And is the leading payer of all nursing homes, covering two-thirds of the cost of all nursing homes. Long-term care insurance is next and can be considered essentially private pay. As you can purchase long-term care insurance policies through private companies. Every policy is different in what it covers but they're meant to help individuals with their activities of daily living, which are things such as bathing and dressing and meal preparation. And they also can help individuals who may have cognitive impairments, such as Alzheimer's or dementia. The cost of the plan varies depending on the type of plan that you purchase, as well as your age and health when you purchase the plan. So if you're interested in purchasing long-term care insurance, it's helpful to talk to a financial advisor to give you guidance on what type of plan Veterans benefits are for veterans or the surviving spouse of a veteran who are 65 and older or some who are younger who may have certain disabilities. These are monthly benefits that you can get and on top of just a regular monthly benefit, you can qualify for what's called the aid and attendance benefit. And this is specifically to help individuals who need assistance with their activities of daily living. Keep in mind though, if you know that you or a loved one is eligible for veterans benefits, there is about a nine-month wait period at this point for them to kick in. They are retroactive, but be aware that if you're planning to use veterans' benefits, that you have alternative means of resources in place to cover that period. And I'm anticipating that this number will only increase from the nine-month wait list. And finally, private pay. This is any funds that you or your loved one may have set aside to pay for care. And now with the current trend of most individuals wanting to remain in their own home and age in place for care, keep in mind that most home care is paid for with private pay funds. So if this is something that you or a loved one wants, try to plan ahead and know that most likely you'll be using private pay funds to pay for this. Now we're going to talk about the different options for care. And the first being home care. Now, there are two types of home care. There is non-medical home care and Medicare certified home care. And I'm actually going to show you a chart to help illustrate the difference of these a little bit better. So, non-medical home care is both companion care and personal care. Companion care is assistance with things such as meal preparation, like housekeeping, running errands, and providing companionship. Personal care is more hands-on care. So assistance with the bathing, dressing, ambulating, medication prompting, which this is different than medication administration. It's simply reminding the person to take the medication and not actually giving it to them. In contrast, Medicare certified home care is assistance with anybody who would have a skilled need, 
So someone who may need a nurse's assistance or need physical therapy or occupational therapy. Keep in mind that Medicare certified, certified home, um, home care excuse me, is typically on a short-term basis following a hospital stay. And that you do need a doctor's orders and meet the criteria for homebound status in order to receive this type of home care. This is the only time Medicare will actually pay for any type of long-term care. And again, it's on a short-term basis.
these things. And if you don't have one, you can still talk to the doctor about your concerns. They just won't be able to give you any information back. So, now that you've noticed some of these changes, what do you do next? It's great to have a family meeting. Bring together any siblings or other caregivers that may be involved to start talking about these concerns that you have. And try to get everybody on the same page so you'll know how to address it to your parent. Well, I don't know how many of you have siblings, but this is easier said than done. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get siblings on the same page, talking about all this, agreeing on it, as we're all adults with different values, different opinions, that can be extremely challenging. And Francine Russo actually has a book that's called They're Your Parents Too, which is a great book that talks about all these challenges with siblings. And in it, she describes the challenges siblings face with caregivers. And she describes it as, it's as if you and your siblings were dropped down in the center of a nuclear reactor and told to figure it out. What comes to mind? Difficult? Maybe impossible? How do you do this? Well, this is actually where your senior care advisor can help you. We can have telephonic consultations with you and any family members to really talk about what you have all observed and help keep the conversation focused on what your parents' care needs are, as well as trying to avoid any familiar conflicts that may come up when having these conversations. They can be a great support to talk about what your short-term and long-term options are and to help you plan ahead. Because these conversations are not a one-time conversation, you'll most likely be having multiple conversations with siblings or other caregivers about this, especially as a parent's level of care need changes. And you're able to talk to your senior care advisor as much as you want about these things, especially as things change, to kind of help you walk you through the process as the situation may change or as things come up. During the family meeting, you can also talk about different tasks and responsibilities and figure out the best way to communicate with your parents. So who's going to take mom to the doctor? Or who do you think dad would listen to best when trying to talk about the conversation of no longer driving? These can be difficult conversations to have. Make sure to use whatever supports you have in place. Sometimes maybe having the doctor talk to a parent about no longer driving can be a great option because the parent may be more apt to listen to the healthcare professional and it takes the pressure off of you as the family members trying to have this conversation with them. So determine what supports you have for you and your family and as I said, use them. Don't try to do it all alone. Be sure to involve your parents in the decision-making process and don't go into the conversation knowing exactly what, what you want for them and knowing this is it, this is what they need. Because it is their life, it is their future, it is their care decisions. And unless a parent is proven incompetent, which is very difficult to do, ultimately it is their decision. So you want to try to make this as a family and a team effort so that everybody can be having these conversations together and be on the same page. Finally, you can use either a social worker or elder law attorney who specializes in mediation if it's more helpful to have an individual actually present with you and your family members in that conversation. So now that you know what you want to talk about, how do you talk to your parents about it and when is a good time? The 4070 guideline is a great guideline that talks about either when you're 40 or your parents are 70, that's a great time to start talking about these senior care issues. And it doesn't matter the general health of a parent, hopefully they're happy and healthy, as this would be the best time to talk to them about it when you're not in the midst of a crisis. However, regardless, start to determine when you should be having the conversation, or if you should be having that now. Again, form a team. Use the supports you have in place, whether this is outside professionals or family members or friends, people in the community, to have these difficult conversations. Talk to your parents about what they want for long-term care, and what are they afraid of. So many people don't want to have these conversations because the parent is afraid that, oh, if, if I acknowledge that something's wrong, you're going to stick me in a nursing home and I'll never see you again. Talk to them about this and start to plan ahead so you can know what they want. 
When you express your concerns, be sure not to do it in an attacking or really worried, concerned, critical manner. You want to keep these conversations open, as you're probably going to be having multiple types of conversations like this. And finally, be sure to address the tough topics. These are things that most of us don't like talking about and we'd much rather avoid. But it's important to talk about these things, such as long-term care options. Maybe your parent wants to live at home, but it's helpful for them to know what options are out there. So when the time comes, if something changes, they'll know what's available. Long-term care options also depend on their financial situation. And although this can often be awkward talking to parents about finances, depending on what resources they have will really give them different options in regards to care. While you're on that topic, you can talk about estate planning as well to plan that aspect in the future and involve an elder law attorney in this conversation if you need. Health status is important as well. What is your parent's health actually like? The average 75-year-old has three or more chronic health conditions. Do you know if your parents have any? What medications are they taking? Do they see the doctor regularly? What's their diet like or do they exercise? What are they doing to care for themselves? Driving. This can be considered the nuclear warhead of senior care. Now this is because of taking away the keys can feel like a loss of independence for an individual. So you want to be sure to have alternative means in place so that your loved ones still have the ability to get around. It doesn't feel stuck. Start to see if you notice anything with their driving. Are there new dents in the car? Have you been in the car with them driving and you maybe you didn't feel very safe? When you bring up these concerns, don't do it in an alarming way. But if you have these conversations ahead of time as well, you can start to plan and prepare while they are still driving and able to do it of what are we going to do come the day that you no longer are able to drive. Taking the keys away should be a last resort as this is only going to cause more tension and resentment and conflict. You want to make sure that you're keeping the situation safe. So again, this is a big topic that often people do call us about. And we can help you with coaching and strategies of how to have these conversations, especially about taking the keys away and driving with a parent. And finally, end-of-life care. This is a hard conversation to have, but it's so important to know what your loved one would want come the end of their life so that you can plan appropriately and that you can meet those needs. So, you know what you want to talk about, you've met with your siblings, you've come up with this plan, you've talked to your parents about it, and they still refuse help. Now what? What do you do? Well, first, what is your parent resistant to? Does your dad not want a housekeeper to come in and help clean the house once or twice a week? Or is he refusing to have conversations about no longer driving after he's been in three accidents in the past week? Learn to pick and choose the battles. Find out if the person has the ability and the capacity to make those decisions for themselves as well. You want to respect the person's need for autonomy and control. This is their life. These decisions that are being made are about them. You want to involve them in the process as much as possible to help make it go smoother. Although we know there's always going to be bumps along the road. Again, using professionals such as healthcare professionals, social workers, or senior care advisor to help you in these conversations. If you've had this great plan and you feel like it just didn't work, have people talk to people who can give you strategies of what to do next with this resistant parent. And finally, you can use services almost on a trial basis. So maybe that you know mom hates cooking, so you talk to her. Mom, what if we had somebody come in here who could help maybe prepare meals for you once a day, because I know you hate doing that. Would, that. would that be helpful to you? Maybe she agrees to that, and then as she develops a relationship with that caregiver, that caregiver can then help with other things that she may need assistance with. It's a great way to get somebody's foot in the door and start out slowly. You don't need to throw somebody in there 24-7 right away if your parent doesn't need it. And again, take care of yourself. I'm reiterating this again because it is so important. You know, when you're
you're on the airplane and you hear them say, in case of a deployment of oxygen masks, <coughs> put yours on first before somebody else. This is the same in caregiving. If you can't take care of yourself and you're not taking care of yourself, you're not going to be able to care for a loved one to the same extent that you may need. Know where your limits are. Know what your strengths are. And be realistic. You're not expected to do all of this on your own. There are a lot of supports out there to help you. It's just finding those supports and accessing those resources. Figure out what helps reduce stress. Whether that's listening to music, going for a walk, maybe doing yoga, and really take the time to do that. Caregiving is a very stressful job. You can attend caregiver support groups, as these are individuals who will know what you're going through and maybe have great ideas to help you in a situation that you're struggling with. Your senior care advisor can also connect you to those support groups in your area. And finally, explore options for respite care. Whether this is through our site, where you can find respite providers, or whether this is using family members or friends, be sure to find those people to give yourself that needed break. There's nothing wrong with taking that time off. So as we end, I wanted to conclude with a quote that I felt like really summed up the caregiving experience. And it's by Winston Churchill. And it says, we make a living by what we get. But we make a life by what we do. Any questions? How do you find out about the veteran benefits? The veterans benefits? Um, there's actually an agency that we work with called Veterans Financial. Um, they're a great benefit. It's an um, 800 number that you can call. And I can send it to you ahead of time. I don't have it with me. Um, and what they do is they would talk to you over the phone about your situation. Um, and see whether you qualify or not. Okay. If you do qualify, they actually help go through all the paperwork with you. And once you send it in, if it gets sent back because something was missing or wrong, they'll help you with that too until it's actually all set and you're just waiting for the benefit to come. So okay. it's a great, great resource. Any other questions? So do you mean 
us, there's just a fee for the services. Um, we have usually a free 15 minute consultation um, initial call with people just to kind of help them whether our service would be best for them or we have multiple services in the company too. So is there another service that might work better? And then if they choose they want to work with us, they can. There's just a fee associated with that. Um, where it's nice that you guys can use us as many times as you want. It's free. So, but yeah, anybody can ultimately call us and have the same service. Yes. So could you? So I'll tell you my scenario. Maybe you can tell me what you were, would recommend. My parents live in California, and my dad is 95, and my mom is 84. And my dad is getting very unsteady and walks with a walker, can't see or hear very well. And I think, and my mom can drive, so she takes care of things, but I can hear in her voice that she's really strained and probably could use a break every once in a while. So how would you set that up? I mean, since they're so far away, are there like other organizations out there that you could recommend somebody that could come and just give her a break maybe once a week or something? Sure, sure. So how we work, because even though we're based in Boston and we work nationally, is we have a whole network of providers that we work with. So we would talk to you on the phone and, and really do an in-depth assessment of what does your dad need? What would be helpful when we're looking for a caregiver? Um, you know, the characteristics, what responsibilities they would need to do, how often. And then what we do is we go to our pro provider network and we find up to three options that we feel would best meet those needs. And in order to have somebody in our provider network, we go through a very in-depth credentialing process with those agencies. Because every state has a different standard for level of care, so we have our own standard that's above all of those. Because we want to make sure we're giving people quality options. So we find those providers, and we also work to negotiate rates with them, as long as Medicaid isn't involved, because otherwise it's illegal. But if you're using any other funds besides Medicaid, we also negotiate rates with those agencies as well to try to help our families just in the cost of care. And then we would actually present you with a written plan of those three provider options so that you could then determine who you think would be the best fit for your loved one. Um, and there's no obligation to use any of our providers. If you weren't satisfied with them, you know, we always work with families until they are. So we'll really work with you through the entire process. And there's no fee for that consultation, but if someone is brought into the home, then a fee is established. Right, right. So any caregivers that you decide to work with, you would have to pay those caregivers. Um, but for the services of speaking with your senior care advisor or connecting you with those services through fromcare.com, those are all free. And we put that on the provider profiles. We'll put the rates down. We'll talk to you about that ahead of time, too, to make sure that you know, you know how much these services would cost in that area. Yes. Would you assist with, like, if somebody already has someone taking care of them, but like every now and then, you know, something goes wrong, maybe that person's family needs them for a while, and mm -hmm. do um, help find interim people that would be, like, on-call yes. people? Yeah, so we actually have two features of our site. You can either call us and say, you know, I need, I need backup care um, or just, you know, short-term care. Um, or you can even go on the site and we have a feature that's called um, backup care. And what it does is it sends out a blast to all of the caregivers in that area. Now, these are private caregivers, not agency caregivers. Um, and it will let them know, hey, I need last-minute care or I need, you know, short-term care for this period. And then they can contact you directly. Um, all of those private caregivers on our site do have to go through background checks. And we have references on them as well. Um, so depending on what you wanted, whether just a private caregiver or agency, we could help with both of those. And, um, and actually, if you use the care on call features for um, so emergency or unplanned cares, so, so say that your regular caregiver falls through um, because they're sick or something, then Washington and Lee will reimburse you up to 60% of the cost of care, up to $200 per year. If you're the one that normally provides that care. Right, if you're, right, if you're the one who right. normally pays for that care. So it would apply if you needed somebody in California to take care of your mom, less than that kind of thing. But if it would enable you to come to work in order, um, you know, that you need care so that you can be able to come to work, then that would be covered under the... I, I was on 
the site. I didn't see too many people in our area. It does, it does vary based on location too, um, and that's why we have a bunch of agencies in this area, because really providers on the private level, um, it's just up to people who are in this area who are qualified to sign up with care.com. And even though we have millions of um, caregivers on the site, in more of a rural location, there may not be as many. Um, so that's why if you wanted to do the care on call and find a private caregiver and we're having trouble, you could call us and we can help you find it through an agency. Mm -hmm. and, and we're also, like, care.com is, is partnering with us to actively build the provider network. And I think that as more people use the site, then the it'll be more attractive to providers as people get, you know, if you're, if you're getting a job through there, then you're more likely to tell your friends who are, who do similar work to also sign up.